Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about tensile testing. As the name suggests, we are going to apply tensile force to our specimen to get tensile properties. So we usually use two different types of specimens, either rectangular coupon, as you can see here, or a dog bone sample, which looks like a dog bone. we apply tensile force until complete failure and we'll get multiple properties. We prefer dog bone samples to rectangular coupon because that ensures where the failure occurs. In a dog bone sample, the failure is more likely to occur here than anywhere else because the force is the same throughout the sample but the area here is reduced that means that the stresses are so if you remember the stress equation for a uniaxial tension is force divided by the area. As the force is the same, the area is reduced, the stresses are higher, therefore the material is likely to fail here. If failure occurs at the grip length, at the grip region, uh, it's not desirable because in this region we have multi-axial uh, loading. In addition to our tensile load that we apply, the grips are applying compressive forces. So if it fails, it's due to multiple uh, loading in that region, and we really can't get the properties. If we want to do any failure analysis, we have to use one misses stresses, because one misses allows multiple stresses and gives us an effective stress. Uh, if we are using a rectangular coupon, we have the same problem. At the grip region, we have multi-axial loading. So in rectangular coupon, we usually use some sort of tabbing. So we attach pieces of metals or plastics to these regions to uh, increase their compressive strengths and uh, to make sure that failure does not occur at the grip region. So that's not a desirable uh, phenomenon for us. And whenever failure occurs here or at this stress concentration region, when we have the change of area, we usually uh, neglect that, uh, we usually ignore that test result because that's not an acceptable test result. So while we are applying loading, we, the equipment constantly measures force and displacement. And then we could plot our force and displacement until failure. But force and displacement is not really desirable for engineers and we usually use a stress strain curve. Can you think why we are using stresses and strains as opposed to force and displacement? If I tell you that the force applied, the maximum force we can apply to a specimen is 150 kilonewton. What does that tell us about the material? Nothing. That depends whether that 150 kilonewton is applied to a small coupon or a larger structure. Or if the displacement is 10 millimeter, it really doesn't tell us uh, much about the ductility or any other feature, simply because if that 10 millimeter is uh, stretched off a specimen with uh, 100 millimeter, that's 10% strain. If it is 10 meter, that's one tenth of uh, 1%. So to remove the effect of geometry, we are using a stress strain curve. And then when we use, when we plot the stress strain curve, the stress strain curve is unique for every material for a steel, regardless of the geometry. Then we could judge the material. And in engineering, we deal with two different types of stresses. Engineering stress, which is based on the force divided by the original area, A0, which is easier because we can measure the original area. That's an engineering stress. We also deal with true stresses. As the name suggests, the stresses are actual stresses because they are referring to the 
area that is changing. It's very difficult to find true stresses. That's why um, in most applications we are we are using engineering stress. Same definition can be applied to strains as well. We have engineering strains, which is based on the original lens, and then we have true strains. So we're going to see what mechanical properties we can obtain from stress strain curve. So if I plot my stress strain curve, let's say we have this kind of a stress strain. The slope gives us elastic modulus. So the first property would be the elastic modulus or would be the a Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity. So it has multiple names. What other properties can we get from stress strain curve? Of course, the maximum stress that the material can handle. That gives us the ultimate strength. So a stress is a is a loading and geometry parameter. Strength is a material parameter. It tells us the maximum stress that a material can handle. So we have ultimate tensile strength. Or S. ULT. What else can we get from this? We can get the yield. SYT. Yield strength is a strength that identifies a region that beyond which our material is going from elastic region to plastic region. So we can get yield as well. And it's shown by SYT. Y is for yield and T is for tension because we can get SYC as well. The other property that we can get from a stress strain curve is a strain to failure. Epsilon F final strain or a strain to failure. What will that tell us, strain to failure? It tells us whether the material is ductile or brittle. So if our strain to failure for metal is more than 5%, that material is, uh, we re is referred to as ductile, otherwise is brittle. So that 5% is just a rule of thumb, depending on the material. Uh, the strain to failure can change drastically. If you remember when we talked about different material types, we refer to elastomers. Elastomers can have a strain to failure up to 200%, 300%, while metals are usually in 4 or 5%, again, depending on whether the material is ductile or brittle. So a strain to failure gives us very good information about that. Another property that we can get from a stress strain curve is the area under stress strain curve, which gives us toughness. Uh, another property similar to toughness, but it's only defined for the elastic region, is the strain energy or to be accurate, that would be a strain energy density. Because if you pay attention here, the elastic region, you can think of it as this triangle because we assume it's a linear elasticity. Linear elasticity. And I'm just plotting here the linear region elasticity and then if this is strain stresses u what is the area of that triangle 
half sigma epsilon. And that's the definition of strain energy density. The strain energy is half sigma epsilon dv or v or al. But we in stress strain, we have removed the effect of area on l by plotting a stress strain. So that gives us strain energy density. If we use force displacement curve, if we have F, D, the area under force displacement curve will give us the strain energy. It gives us this value, AL or half FL. So we can get six main properties out of our stress strain curves. So your first task is to convert forces into stresses, convert the strains into convert displacements into strains. Then once we have the plot, we can get the properties. Uh, to get the properties and to know information about the samples, we use a standard because we want to compare apples to apples. If you're doing testing here and somebody's doing testing in University of California, when you're comparing your results, when you're presenting your results, you need your results need to be comparable. So we have a standard of ASTM, which is stands for American Society for Testing and Material. And the ASTM that we are going to use for tensile testing of metal is E8. That gives us information about the dimensions of the specimens, uh, how to determine elastic modulus, yield strength, and other information. Uh, the yield strength uh, might be a little bit more challenging compared to the other ones uh, because it's very difficult to say where the region is. And the plots for different material, uh, each time you test it, you get a different plot. So a rule in ASTM E8 is that to use a line at a 0.2 strain, 0.2% strain and draw a parallel line to elastic modulus. And whenever it hits our stress strain curve, that would indicate our yield. So again, for yield, for yield strength, you're referring to a strain of 0.2%. 0.2% means 0 0.002 strain. So 0.2% doesn't mean 0.2 strain. 0.2 strain means 20%. So, and then you, you should not read the stress at this region. You're going to draw a parallel line to the elastic region. And then whenever it hits the stress the strain curve, your, you will have the yield. A common mistake that I see students make is that they remember this value and then they come here and then this is the value of 0 0.002 then they read the stress here and said oh that's yield but that is incorrect you have to draw a parallel line and whenever it hit that would be your yield Prior to testing, we get measurements of our specimens. We have initial measurement and final measurement. So our specimen is a dog bone. We get the length, the width, and the thickness. Similar for the final. The length, width, and thickness. Because we are doing tensile testing, and we are going to use the grip length, sorry, the gauge length, which is two inch, based on our ACM standard. Are you expecting LF to be bigger or smaller than our initial length? Of course, it's tensile testing, so LF would be bigger than the initial length. What can you say about 
the width and thickness and this would be our thickness the thickness would be less according to Python effect Similar for the widths. So by comparing the final length minus the initial length divided by, we can get the strain to failure or we can get elongation. Then we could judge whether our material is brittle or ductile, or how brittle or how ductile it is, or when we are comparing different materials, we could uh, talk about the elongation. Also for the area reduction. We know our area is reduced according to Python effect. So if you have the final area, initial area, divided by the initial area. And what is the f area is W, the width times the thickness, again the width times the thickness, and we get area reduction of our material. So we can report elongation, area reduction, uh, and so in addition to number six, we can have uh, number seven here and call it area reduction. That's another information that we can get from a stress strain curve of a tensile specimen. Because if it's compression, we no longer have area reduction. Our area is uh, increased. Uh, one other thing that I would like to mention here is that uh, the, the tensile equipment is returning the force and displacement. And our testing could be either displacement controlled or force controlled. Uh, to ensure that we have an accurate measurement of displacement, extensometer are used. Either we can use mechanical extensometer with a device with two points uh, mounted here, and then there is called extensometer. We measure the displacement of our specimen at these two points. So it has sensors here at these two points and whenever our specimen is moved it measures the displacement and uh, this is more accurate than the displacement and the machine returns because we could place it exactly at the, our grip length and we get the force the force is the same uh, throughout the specimens and then we could have a more accurate plot for our stress strain curve uh, extensometer or either mechanical and nowadays we have laser extensometer as well that the concept is the same you wrap a tape here you wrap a tape here and then and then you have a camera and with a laser and then it would detect the movement of our specimens because we are interested in that grip length at, the, at this uh, gauge length. Uh, we can get the force with the equipment, that's fine. We can use that force, but for the displacement, the machine is gonna give us the displacement of the whole specimen. Not only this uh, gauge length, that's why we prefer to use extensometer. And the extensometer will give us a more accurate results of our um, stress a strain careful.